Welcome back to ECE 320A. We are two days removed from your third exam. That's the next time that you come to class, there will be an exam. I hope that doesn't surprise anyone. Homework number eight is due tonight. We have a review session in four and a half hours in this same location if you are interested. And today what I want to do is quickly slide through what we'll do for exam number three. The process is consistent with what we've done for the other pro exams. Then we will go through sinusoidal steady state examples and computing graphically H of J omega. The process for exam three is the same as the previous, except you get one more sheet of notes, front and back. The topics are really the material from homework six, seven, and eight. But in very brief terms, you need to be able to do S-domain circuit analysis. How do you find the S-domain impedances for L and C? incorporating initial conditions, putting in sources, finding transfer functions, do all the different pieces and parts of convolution, the flip and slide, the limits and intervals, etc., to find the actual value for convolution, and then doing sinusoidal steady state analysis. You should be able to calculate what the transfer function is at a particular frequency omega naught, either analytically, by that I'm meaning just plug in the number and compute a complex value or a complex number, and from that you should be able to obtain the magnitude and angle for that complex number, and that will give you how your system behaves at that particular frequency. So if you're shaking the system, at omega naught, you know how your system is responding. There is plenty of review material, I believe, on the website. Let's then start you with a quiz or a little exercise with a circuit example doing sinusoidal steady state analysis. If you are given a voltage of 5 cosine of 2t plus 45 degrees, what's going to be this current at the far right branch in the steady state? And I would hope that you could actually immediately write down some partial credit. If you were solving this on an exam, you could at least write down I sub 0 sub SS of T. Yes? <laughs> and then say equals. Then what else do you know is making up that particular answer? How are you shaking this system? Or what is the critical piece of information in that voltage source that's being applied to the circuit. It's a cosine and how fast is it shaking? That's one of the key pieces and once you have that, now what do you need to start solving this problem? What's sort of the first step in this process. Now that you've identified that you are going to get or obtain I sub Z, I sub zero steady state, you will get a cosine. It will be at two radians per second. You now have to figure out what is the actual amplitude and what's the phase of that result in the sinusoidal steady state. This could be a question on the exam. What's your next step now that you need know or now that you understand what you're trying to find, what's sort of the next piece that you want to go for? 
Yes. So everything today is fair game for the exam. I don't think we'll get further than that. If we get into Bodhi plots, we probably won't do Bodhi plots explicitly, but it will give you a conceptual view of what's going on on the exam. All right. On the exam, there should be very little hesitation in your next step. You might say, I need to find the transfer function. What is H of S for this circuit? If I knew H of S, then you could find out how it behaves at what frequency. This problem. Two. So now you would want to evaluate that transfer function Replace S with J2. You're moving up the imaginary axis up to the location of 2 in the imaginary axis direction. So let's find H of S for this circuit. Again, some partial credit. What is this relative to the variables that are identified in this circuit? It's something over something. What's on top? That's going to be your output, which in this case is the I sub 0 of S, and the input is V sub I of S which means if you can now find an equation for I sub 0 of S in terms of V sub I of S, you're essentially done. Because then you can just divide out V sub I of S from that expression, and that's your transfer function. Now, if you're trying to find I sub 0 of S as a function of V sub I of S, how might you solve that? Okay, one approach would be find the total impedance. You're jumping ahead of me. Yes, so I was trying to explain the one approach. One was find the total impedance, get the current, and then do a current divider. Another one was node analysis. You could even do two mesh equations, but then you have two equations and with nodal analysis, you'll just have one, but you then have to back out the I sub zero from that one node voltage. What you need to sort of be clear on is that now you can effectively treat this like an, a, one resistor. Here is another resistor, and here is another resistor. They're just a complex impedance expression which says that if you did do nodal analysis, you could say, oh, let me just concentrate on that node, and maybe I will call that V sub 0 of S. And then I just have one equation. If I can solve for V sub 0 of S, you can find I sub 0 of S in terms of V sub 0 of S. Whoops. I'm marking on my time domain diagram, and I always get upset when students start mixing frequency and time. So let me just call that V sub 0 of T, and let me go down and draw another circuit in the S domain. Not that you have to on the exam, but it's nice to make sure that you're clear that you don't mix time and frequency. Here we had a resistor and an inductor. Here was an inductor and a capacitor, another inductor and capacitor. And what were these impedance values? This was 1. What's the impedance value of that horizontal inductor? Actually, they were all 1 Henry, weren't they? So those are all just going to be SL or S. Your capacitors did have different values. 
you had one capacitor being a capacitance of 1. That's 1 over SC. That's this guy. And the other one was 1 over SC. But that's 1 over S over 2. So let's just say that's now 2 over S. Now in this circuit, I can use my V sub 0 of S. Here was the I sub 0 of S. And if you were thinking your way through this problem, you could say, oh, well, I'm going to find I sub 0 of S from V sub 0 of S, which will then be V sub 0 divided by what? S plus 2 over S, or the impedance in that branch. And if I now solve KCL at that node, I can now worry about finding that current, this current, and I sub 0, and I will be done. Those three currents, all leaving that node, must sum to 0. What's the horizontal blue current from right to left? To give me a positive current in that blue arrowhead direction, what would I, how would I define that? You guys know how to do this. This isn't hard. That's now the current going to the left. What's the current going down in the center branch? And finally, Is it clear where that formula is coming from? And now you have one equation in terms of the one unknown, V sub 0. V sub i is our input. But now if we solve for V sub 0 and replace that or put that in here, then may I just say You've all seen that cartoon where they this professor's up the board and then he says magic happens and then he writes the answer, sort of. That's what I'm saying here, except instead of magic, it's just algebra. So if you use some algebra between the blue equation and the black equation, you don't need to get black and blue by solving that, but you'll get H of S is equal to I sub 0 of S over V sub I of S, which is equal to S, S squared plus 1 over 3S to the fourth plus 2S cubed plus 6S squared plus 3S plus 2. Did everyone get that in their quiz answer? <laughs> Just a little algebra. Yes? So, raw transfer function would, uh, that would change obviously if we want to see the relationship. Not I not, not. So, that could be something. So, the transfer function that you find, in this case, let's say this is h sub 1, you could have a different transfer function h sub 2 that could have been v sub 0 of s over v sub i of s. And it will be different, but the denominator will be the same. The numerator is what will be different. So it really just depends on what is asked for 
If I asked for the current and the middle branch, you would solve for it just the same way. That would maybe be, let's say that's now I sub 1. Then you could have an, I, an H sub 3, which would be, whoops, I sub 1 of S over V sub I of S, etc. Question? Yes, it's going to be the output over the input. That's your transfer function. So that if you now multiplied that transfer function, H sub 3, by your input, that produces your output. That's the whole idea behind this transfer function. Know that let's say H sub 3 is I1 over V sub I. If you need I1, just multiply H3 by V sub I. Then inverse Laplace transform, and what does that give you? That gives you the complete response for that input. We don't need that. We just need the sinusoidal steady state. We're assuming the transients are gone. We just want to know how is this behaving after the transients have decayed. And now that we have H sub 1 of S, what would you do, or where are the zeros located? How many zeros do you have? It, so now you multiply that out and find your highest power of s, right? To find how many zeros you have. You have a cubic upstairs. You have three zeros. One of those zeros is right at the origin. The other two. Those are now at plus and minus j. Those are on the imaginary axis. So you now have three zeros on the imaginary axis. Now, this I might not give you on the exam because this is a fourth order and that unfairly positions some of you with others because some may have a nice calculator that finds the roots of a tenth order and somebody else might have the blue light special that has addition and subtraction. And I don't want to make that an unfair advantage, so I would have to somehow give you, maybe on the side, I would serve up, do you want that on the side? So you would now have this fourth order polynomial factored maybe into two quadratics, which the quadratics might have too real, or they could have complex roots. But what's important now? If you now said, if you're asking me to find the sinusoidal steady state, what do you need to check before you go any further? You need to make sure those poles are in the left half plane. They have to have negative real parts. They have to be stable. Otherwise, when you apply that cosine to this system, it's going to go unbounded if you have an unstable pole. You'll excite that mode and that mode will go unbounded and you definitely won't reach a steady state. So I've done that work for us. Let me just say that the poles for that fourth order are at minus 0 0.0151 plus and minus J 1.245 minus 0 0.318 plus and minus j 0 0.573. Very nice, neat poles. Mm -hmm. Not. Which really, if you wanted to sketch this, You now have a zero here, you have a zero there, and a zero there. Those are nice, whoops, that's not where I wanted them, because I wanted that one to be a half. So let me say that this is now J1, and this is minus J1, just to space things out a little bit more. And then you have a pole, and this won't be accurate, but it's a little bit... Above 1, 
in the imaginary direction. It's one and a quarter, but it's really tight up against the imaginary axis. It only has a value of minus 0 0.015. And then the other one is a third of the way towards minus 1, but it's now down a little bit above plus and minus J5. So that's now your pole zero constellation or your pole zero diagram for that system. And the key is not so much where those zeros are, it's where the poles are. And all of those poles are in the left half plane. So I theoretically could give you a pole zero diagram and say, what's the sinusoidal steady state output for this input? I would have to give you the DC gain, maybe, or the gain of your transfer function, but now you know where the poles and zeros are. And you could put those in to an expression for H of S. Now what? V sub I of T, the input was 5 cosine 2t plus 45 degrees. And I sub 0, steady sinusoidal steady state, is what we're after. And you told me that one of the keys was that frequency there, which means that we now need to evaluate our transfer function h of s at that particular point imaginary axis, which if we were doing it graphically, we would be going right to there and now trying to find all the contributions from those poles and zeros up to that triangle. And that would be helping us compute graphically what this transfer function looks like when we evaluate it at J2. But you can now simply replace every S in that expression with J2. The numerator was S times S squared plus 1. And the denominator was 3, s squared to the fourth, uh, s squared to the fourth, s to the fourth, s squared squared, plus 2 times j2 cubed, plus 6 j2 squared, plus 3 j2 plus 2. And that's what I mean by computing this analytically. And if you had a blue light special, you might say, is this good? Right? I mean, you have a fourth order. You would need to do that maybe by hand unless your calculator did complex math, which you can do. You know how to square j, how to cube j, and how to raise j to the fourth. j is a nice person right? Or a nice argument. And J, where is J here? It's right there. There's J, isn't it? That's J. Wave hi to J. Hi, J. All right. Now, if you compute this, you will end up upstairs with just minus J6 and downstairs 26 minus J10, which if you do the algebra, you end up with a complex number having a real part of 0 0.0773 and an imaginary part of minus 0 0.201 really need it in polar form instead of rectangular form. And so you need to be comfortable doing that math. And now we're going down minus 0.2 and over 0 0.07. So we're going down more than we're going over. So we should be 
at something bigger than minus 45. That's now the value that you get for this circuit, how it behaves at 2 radians per second. If you're shaking this circuit at 2 radians per second, that's how its amplitude will be scaled. It will be almost cut by one-fifth or divided by, not cut by one-fifth, scaled by one-fifth, divided by five, and the angle is changed now by minus 69 degrees. <coughs> now it's very easy to write down the result. We started at five. That gets changed by the magnitude of H at J2. We now have a cosine. It's still at the same frequency. It started at 45 degrees, and now we're taking away 69 degrees. Or if you just, and on the exam, that's probably far enough. You don't have to go any further. But if you wanted to multiply that out, you would have 1.08 cosine 2t minus 24 degrees. Questions on that example? You know how to do that. All right, then demonstrate that. Let's go through another example. Suppose now you might just start with a transfer function, not a circuit. Maybe somebody gives you H of S of 1,000 S plus 5,000 all over S squared plus 6,000 S plus 25 times 10 to the 6th. And let's suppose that they're exciting that. The input now is 120 cosine 5,000 T plus 30 degrees. Now, what's the first step that you need to do before you go any further? You need to check your poles. And those poles need to be in the left half plane. They have to have negative real parts. And I told you, I think, how to do that if you have a quadratic. You don't even have to factor it. You don't have to do anything. You just have to visually look at that. And what do you want your denominator in a quadratic to look like. They need to be present and positive, right? They have to be there and happy. Present and positive. The coefficients, 6,000 and 25 times 10 to the 6th, are present and positive. It's stable. You know that only for a second order. Higher orders, that doesn't work. That's only a necessary and sufficient condition for a second order polynomial to be pe present and positive. So you need to state or check that H of S is stable. Otherwise, it makes no sense to be computing H of anything in t unless you want to show how it behaves in an unstable fashion. But H of S is stable because the coefficients of the denominator And what have I already assumed? I've assumed that that denominator was monic, which really just means that the leading coefficient has been normalized to 1. So if you have a monic second order polynomial, as long as the linear coefficient and the constant coefficient are present and positive, your system is, has stable roots. Coefficients of denominator are present and positive. And again, that only works for a second order. Now that we've concluded that we can do our H 
how do where do we evaluate it? At this omega naught, which is 5,000. So now we need to identify that the frequency of interest is 5,000, and that's in radians per second. And we can now compute h of j 5,000, which is 1,000. Then we have j 5,000 plus 5,000 all over j 5,000 squared plus 6,000 times j 5,000 plus 25 times 10 to the 6th. Or that 5,000 plus j 5,000, that's a nice rectangular form, isn't it? It's now 5,000 times the square root of 2 in magnitude, and it's an angle of 45 degrees. So you know that immediately. And I'm going to just factor out the 1,000 times 1,000 to give me times 10 to the 6th. And that's now at an angle of 45 degrees. That's the numerator. And you didn't even need your blue light special to do that. You needed this special thing between your ears, your brain, to do that. Yes? Why? Oh, sorry, I'm dating me. They used to have at different department stores every hour or two, they would roll a cart around and it would have a flashing blue light and they would go, blue light special on aisle seven. And you'd run over to aisle seven and there's a calculator that's maybe, well, in the old days it was quite expensive, but now it would be $2. That was the blue light special. You guys didn't know that? Oh, sorry. Those jokes then go right over, don't they? No joke at all. Sorry. Now, down to the denominator, what do we have? We have j squared, which is minus 1. So we have 5 squared times 10 to the 6 with a negative sign. And we have 25 times 10 to the 6. Those cancel. And we're left with 6 times 5, or 30, times 10 to the 6 at what angle? J. And where's J relative to the positive horizontal? 90 degrees. So this is now 30 times 10 to the 6 at 90 degrees. And this can clean up pretty quickly. 30 I can factor into 6 and 5, and the 5's cancel with the numerator and denominator, and I have the square root of 2 over 6 at what angle? I just have to subtract the denominator from the numerator, and there's my answer. So that if I plug that into my x to find my y, I now have y steady state, sinusoidal steady state, is 120 scaled by the magnitude of h at j5000 cosine of 5000. And what was my original angle was 30 degrees, and I take away from that 45. So that now, if I clean that up just a little, I can divide 6 into 120 to give me 20 times the square root of 2 cosine 5,000t minus 15 degrees. Questions on that? We did all of those with an analytical computation or evaluation of our transfer function at the given frequency. Yes? So H is stable under what condition? We have a transfer function. I hand you a transfer function, H of S. 
When is that stable? You only really have to worry about the poles for stability. If I ask, is it minimum phase, then the poles have to be in the left half plane and the zeros have to be in the left half plane. But if you're just interested in stability, you just need the poles in the left half plane. So you factor the denominator and you want all of those roots to have negative real parts and then you can, you can conclude that the transfer function is stable. Does that answer your question? So if they're on the imaginary axis, what happens? Let's say that you now have a transfer function and it has poles on the imaginary axis. Let's say that you now have h of s, which is s squared plus 1, and let's say that's now 5. Where are your poles? Those are right at plus and minus j. So that now we have, whoops. We have a pole there and a pole there due to the system. What happens? Well, if you just hit that with an impulse, it would just sit there and shake. At what frequency? That was maybe a bad example, but it's shaking at one radian per second. But here's the kicker. I can apply a bounded input to produce an unbounded output. What input could I put in that's bounded that would produce an unbounded output? How could I excite this? So now somebody gives you, this is now an oscillator. They've now built an oscillator and it naturally wants to shake or oscillate at one radian per second. Now if you shake it at exactly that frequency where it likes to shake, then what happens? It starts growing with time. The analogy is the following. Now you're saying if you put in an input x of s of let's say 1 over s squared plus 1, now you have those are supposed to be on top of each other. I'm exaggerating their separation just to show you that they're on there. But you now have repeated poles and y of s is now this 1 times 5 squared plus 1 squared. But remember what, if y of s was let's say 6 over s, what was y of t? If y of s, maybe I should say y sub 1, y of 2, let's say this is 7 over s squared, what's y sub 2 of t? What's that doing as time evolves, y sub 2? It's growing, isn't it? Well, this square what's causing that and that's what would cause this. So that this would give rise to a t cosine of 1t type term or a t sine of t. In this case it's actually since there's no s in the numerator I think you're going to end up with just a sine. But this is the repeat that three times now. This is now what's causing it to go unbounded. It's doing this and just going with time. So I could pick a bounded input. Wow, all of that was because of a question. What happens if the poles are on the imaginary axis? You don't want that. If that's, the, that's the bottom line. All right. Other questions? Is that clear? So you want them off of the, and 
Theoretically, they just have to be barely off the imaginary axis in the left half plane. Practically, depending on what your system is, you probably want them a little ways into the left half plane. So that system here, this H of S, is not bounded input, bounded output stable. Somebody might say, they might be texting, and they may say, is that BIBO stable? Bounded input, bounded output stable. This system would not be BIBO stable. That's getting us into the next class, a controls class. All right. Let's now look at doing this, not analytically, but graphically. Uh, that class you would find in 441A, which is offered in the fall semester. It's being taught right now at 8 a.m. on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. <laughs> I was just thinking you were wanting to sit in on it, so I thought I'd just tell you when you need to set your alarm. Okay? And it's in Harville room 204. Wow, don't ask me any more about these classes in ECE. Yes? Pardon? Yes, that is a technical elective. All right. I'm out of questions for questions. Let's move on. How's that? Suppose now we start with H of S of 1,000. times the quantity S plus 5,000, and then we have S plus 3,000 squared plus 4,000 squared. And I've written the denominator in a factored manner to allow you to explicitly see where those poles are located. Meaning, I hope that you can now see that you have one of those factors of S plus 3,000 minus J 4,000, and the other one is its conjugate. And is your system stable? If you set those two parenthetical expressions in the denominator equal to zero and solve for S, you would see that the real parts are minus 3,000. Indeed, this is a stable system. Where does this pole live? Which quadrant in the four quadrants of the S-plane? So you know it's in the left half plane, so it's in either the second or the third, right? So we've at least eliminated half of the possible quadrants because we now know that it's in the left half plane. Is it clear that that minus j when you put it on the other side becomes the plus j, so that's why that's maybe confusing, but this is now the pole in the third quadrant. And if we now wanted to sketch that in the s-plane, Now, let's say that I, well, we're, this is now scaled by 10 to the 3. This is the S-plane. So each of those tick marks is effectively 1,000, but this I'm going to label as J1, 
j3 minus j minus j3 minus 5. Where do I put my x's and o's? Do I have any open circles for this transfer function? That's at the minus 5 in the real. So it's right there. And where are my x's? In Texas, sorry. <laughs> in the left half plane. You don't want to go east today. It's too stormy, right? It's cold. It's colder than here. It's the 17th of November. Where are my poles? No longer using the other term. The poles are at minus 3,000 plus and minus J4,000 so that I'm now up here and down there. That's supposed to be at minus 4,000 or minus 3,000 plus and minus J4,000. And let's say that we want to evaluate that. Suppose we want h of j2000. Then if we were doing it analytically, we would have 1000 j omega naught plus 5000. And then we would have j omega naught plus 2000 minus j4000. j omega naught plus 3000 plus j4000. And what we want to do is really say, oh, if we're interested in what that looks like at j2000, we want to march up the imaginary axis to j2000 and see how this pole contributes the distance that pole is away from that triangle is the magnitude contribution from that pole and the angle that that pole makes relative to this positive horizontal line let me call this theta sub p sub 1 is the angle that that particular pole factor contributes to the overall expression for h of j2000. Then the contribution that this zero makes magnitude-wise is the length. Now we could get out our dividers and actually measure that or our ruler. This is the angle that that zero makes. And this is now the length or the magnitude contribution and this is the phase. And let me call this length L sub P1, this is L sub Z, and this is L sub P sub 2. Meaning, if we could compute those, and we can, we would say that H of J2000 is now we have to keep track of that original magnitude, but now we have that complex number in the numerator has a magnitude of LZ1. That's the distance from that zero up to. So if you look at this, this is now, we're replacing this with 2000. And do you see that if we started right here at minus 5,000, we walk over 5,000, and then how far up do we go? We go in the vertical direction with the J, 2,000. Now we have a right triangle. We just need to know what's the distance, what's the hypotenuse of that right triangle. That's L sub Z. And what's the angle? 
for that right triangle emanating from that zero, it's two or it's the inverse tangent of two over five. And it's just theta sub z. Is it clear where those variables, what they would numerically be equal to? If we do that for the bottom, how many magnitudes and angles do we have? Two. So in this case, we if we're starting, this is our one in the second quadrant. So from the, this pole, we march over 3,000, and that will get us right there in the horizontal direction. Then what do we do? Well, we go down 4,000 and back up 2,000. So that we now go down 4,000 and back 2,000 and we're back at that triangle. It says then that the distance hypotenuse wise is L sub P1 and the angle is theta sub P1. Down here then we have L sub P1 at an angle of theta P1. This is L sub P2 at an angle of theta P sub 2. Is it clear where those are coming from? And if we wanted to compute those, do you see that you could actually, if you had sketched this accurately, you could get out your protractor and your ruler and physically measure those. That's why in your purchase kit for this class, it, it had crayons, 48 pack, <laughs> protractor, ruler, and if you wanted to go extra, you could do your dividers. No, you don't remember seeing that in the union or the bookstore. So what is L sub Z? Our zero factor, if we were looking at that, here's the J2 and here's the minus 5. L sub Z is now this square root of 2 squared plus 5 squared times 10 to the 3 or that's the square root of 29 times 10 to the 3 which is a little bit more than 5 and the angle theta sub z so this is the L sub z and this angle theta sub z is the inverse tangent of 2 over 5 or 2,000 over 5,000. We can cancel those and this ends up being 21.8 degrees which means on the exam if I say what's the angle contributed by the zero could calculate it and say 21.8 degrees. If I said what's the <coughs> phase contribution of the zero factor from H of S at a frequency of 2000. You would now compute that to get you to this 2000 location and now you would compute the angle. Is that clear where that's coming from? And if we could do that for the others, do we want to? We don't need to for the upper pole and the lower pole. Are you okay with computing those lengths and angles? All right. So now if we put all of those together, this would now be 0 0.223 at an angle of 21.8, that's the angle of the zero, minus the angles from our poles, 
the one in the second quadrant was actually looking down to get to 2,000, so that minus 33 shouldn't be a surprise. And the other one you were having to look up more than 45, it was actually 63.43 degrees. And we then end up with this being minus 7.94 degrees. I didn't give you an X, did I? I just said suppose H is, or we want to evaluate H at J2000. Suppose X was 2 times the cosine of 2000 T minus 10 degrees. What's Y sub steady state? Is everybody comfortable with that? Now, when is that going to basically be all there is in the output? By that I mean, at what point will the transients be gone? Can you tell me what that is? Okay, so you can say 5 tau, but can you find tau for the system that we had? Here's H of S. What's that going? To, what's the impulse response of H of S going to look like? Can you see that? And what are you looking for to find the modes of your impulse response for this system, capital H of S? What are you looking at? Pardon? So now you are looking at, if you're interested in the time constant, you're trying to find how far over into the left half plane am I with these poles. So a lot of different information here, isn't there? For those poles, you could find many different values. You could say, how far are you horizontally into the left half plane? That's one number. You could also say, what's the damped frequency of oscillation? That's how far up it is in the vertical direction, and that's 4,000. Or you could say, what's the natural frequency? And that's the hypotenuse, or the distance from the origin to that x. That's the natural frequency. So you have three different numbers associated with those poles. A damping, how much is that? How far into the left half plane are you? That's 3,000. Damped frequency, that's the vertical distance. That's 4,000. Natural frequency, this is luckily a 3, 4, 5 triangle, so that's 5,000. What do we want to determine the transient? Well, this guy, in terms of its impulse response, it would look like e to the minus what? And it would have a cosine piece and a sine piece. And I want you to fill in these pieces. Based on that, So it's, this is based on the real part. The cosine and sine are shaking at the same frequency, aren't they? Those are your damped frequencies. Now, from that impulse response structure, can you extract the time constant? You are now saying, oh, with respect to this, what influences the decay? 
this is an exponentially decaying sine and cosine. So this looks like something like that when you combine the sine and cosine. You want to know what is influencing this exponential decay and what is influencing the decay. That's this guy, isn't it? There's your exponential. And you are trying to examine that relative to an e to the minus t over tau. If you could find tau, that's your time constant. If you equate the black expression with the blue and red expression, do you see how you can find tau? 1 over tau. 1 over tau is 3,000. Or tau is now, magically, 1 over 3,000. And you told me 5 tau, didn't you? So the transient is gone after 5 tau. That's now 5 over 3,000 seconds. Or 1 over 600 seconds. Long time you have to wait to reach sinusoidal steady state. Not. Right? That's one-sixth of 0 0.01. So you're not having to wait very long before you get to that expression for the sinusoidal steady state. Do you see now why you were studying sinusoidal steady state in 220? Why are we doing this? Mm -hmm. Because you get there almost instantly. And maybe that's all you're interested in, is how is your sinusoidal steady state response for a sinusoidal excitation? Questions on that? All right, let's do one more. Suppose that I now say, so I could ask you that on the exam. I could say, how long do you need to wait before you before you reach sinusoidal steady state? Or how long is the transient? Is it clear how you would find that now, given a transfer function? Well, what if your transfer function had more than one decay on it? So now let's say that we had maybe h of s was 7s plus 2s plus 10. What modes are, what's the order of this system? I didn't hear. Second, second order, you have a second order denominator. What kind of modes are present in your impulse response? Does that make any sense? What are your exponential terms in your impulse response? Without even doing any partial fraction expansion, you can, by inspection, you know this is what two pieces are going to be in your impulse response. If you kick that system, this is how it's going to move. Which of those is the slowest or which of those dominates? So this is the slow and this is the fast. Or this might be referred to as the dominant mode. Which do you use to find how fast your transient will disappear? 
You need to use the slow one, don't you? The e to the minus 10t will be gone much quicker than the e to the minus 2t. The e to the minus 2t will be your dominant transient. So in this case, we have agreed that if you had 100 different exponentials, you would be looking at the exponential that was closest to the imaginary axis, or the smallest k. Here, then, your transient is 5 tau. In this case, you're looking at 2t with t equal to tau equaling 1, or tau equaling 1 half. So that now your transient is 5 tau is this 5 times one half or two and a half seconds. Is that clear? Now you can extend that by our agreement. It's going to be a little different in reality, but we're just agreeing that for making things simpler, if you now have four poles Find the pole that's the closest to the imaginary axis and use that, even if it's complex. Find its real part and use that to determine your tau. Can you do that problem? And could you do it graphically? Could you sketch this? Could you sketch it on the back of an envelope and present that to somebody that's interviewing you? You could say, oh, let me explain how this works. How this sinusoidal steady state behavior this is what I learned in class. Let me show you. I'm really excited about it. Because you need to be present and positive at your interview, right? You need to be stable. You need to be stable in your interviews. What would you sketch if they said, can you sketch the S-plane diagram associated with that problem statement? Hopefully I can count. What do we have where? I'm saying that we might have as an open, some open circles, some X's, and some triangles. Where would, where would we locate an X? The open circle. Where are we evaluating this transfer function at what frequency? And where is that frequency located? Is it here? It's on the imaginary axis. It's at J6, isn't it? So we go up here 6 and do our evaluation there. And now you can get out your rulers and protractors to find that. Meaning, you could compute this distance and that's, let's say that's LZ and the angle here is theta Z. And this is scaled still, you can't drop that 30. And our transfer function is in pole zero form, which is the form that you need it in to be doing these computations graphically. There's L sub P and there's theta sub P.
and this now becomes 30 LZ over L sub P at an angle of theta sub Z minus theta sub P. But do you see that you can now actually eyeball that angle? What's theta sub Z? Roughly, if you've drawn this somewhat to scale, somewhat accurately on your napkin, what is theta sub Z? Roughly. Theta sub Z? It's more than 45, isn't it? Because you're going up 6 and you're only going over 1. So you're having to strain your neck a little bit more than 45. Isn't it maybe 80? It's getting close to 90, isn't it? 85? 80.53? <laughs> yes, let's, let's get this down to... And what is the theta sub P? Okay. We're going over 10 and up how many? Six. We didn't go up 10, did we? So we're not up to 45 yet. So now maybe, and this diagram is probably not drawn to scale, but it, if it was drawn to scale, you could eyeball this. So now you have 80 minus 40 in round numbers, something like 40 degrees. It's 50. It's 49.57. See how you can eyeball this and you can check your work just by drawing? And you wondered why you were drawing in second grade. I did, but now I know. <laughs> now we know that Y steady state of T... I didn't. I, I hope I said it's less than 45. Did I say... Oh, the total. So, so theta sub z minus theta sub p is bigger than 45. So I said this guy here was, let's say, 85. And this one, we said, was roughly 40. And it actually ends up being 49. So this is, in fact, 49.57 degrees. And this number, with the 30 taken into account, is 15.65. That's this whole piece. So that Y steady state becomes, we started with a magnitude of 2, we scale that by the magnitude of H at J6, cosine, what was our frequency of oscillation. That was 6t. And then we had a plus 49.57 degrees. See how easy these are? Or how straightforward they are? And it's nice when you can sort of think your way through it from the picture. Because how long is the magnitude from minus 1 to 6? It's a little bit more than 6, but it's right about at 6, isn't it? Because you're not going over very far in the horizontal. And what's the distance between minus 10 and J6? Well, that's this square root of 6 squared plus 100. Square root of 136. And you know what the square root of something is. 144 is 12, right? So you know it's a little less than 12. So now you have 30 times whatever we just said, 6 divided by 12. So now we have 30 divided by 2, 15. And it turned out to be 15.65. See how you can check your work without too much time? Wow, I'll let you go. It's a minute early. You're welcome. TCEs are now available. <laughs> I'll see you tonight or definitely on Thursday for the exam.